No, um, unfortunately, Dr. Curry was not, not able to be here today to talk about the CDC uh, resources. Uh, maybe I could just get things started for uh, Aaron. So um, uh, you, you addressed this a little bit of how is it that, that ClinGen and ClinVar are trying to um, leverage and capitalize on all of the other more gene-specific or disease-specific organizations that are out there classifying variants uh, as to function and trying to harmonize um, the information in ClinGen and ClinVar based on all these competing resources, or, or is that just an impossible task and be beyond what's feasible? Well, it is a very difficult task, of, of course, but it's one that we must try at least to do, and I think at least in the space of other groups that are already um, working on variant interpretation or gene-specific guidelines, things like that, we do make a concerted effort to reach out to those groups as we um, are aware of them and kind of bring them into the fold and encourage them to also become three-star expert panel um, submitters to ClinVar. So we do have a couple of exa examples of that, such as the CFTR group, um, or the um, insight group, you know, groups that were already existing outside before we even ever came to be, that we said, hey, you know, it'd be great if you could put that information into ClinVar so everyone could access it. You'll get all the credit. You'll be listed as a three-star submitter so people kind of know which, which variant interpretations are the ones that were the result of, of consensus. I mean, I know for PharmGKB and CPIC, we've been working with um, ClinVar for a long time trying to get our information more transparently available. And it's, it, it really is a challenge because the system wasn't really built for pharmacovariants. Exactly. And, um, yes, and the last thing that you want is to duplicate information from one place to another because the primary source of the information will be updated and change over time. So uh, I, there's so many cancer specific, for example, uh, un, un, uh, I don't want to say uncurated, but unconsolidated sources of information on somatically acquired cancer variants and, and making sure that people get access to the most updated information seems to be almost an overwhelming task. I mean, something that it seems like we have to tackle, but I'm not sure how to do that. Oh, I see the vertical things I'm supposed to pay attention to. Who was the first one? I'm struck by the, this morning's talk as well as the current talks that about we are con continually saying, you know, if the payers would pay for the testing, all would be well. And what I'm struck by is how that's actually a tiny fraction of what the real cost is of, of implementing. Um, uh, you know, for example, for ClinVar, my, my, my company has somebody who's essentially full-time job is ClinVar. So that's a whole FTE, that's sweat equity, that's donated by a company. Um, all the work that, that I heard this morning about um, getting the uh, practice guidelines in and working with uh, the EMRs and working with your local um, systems, that's all labor that is n never going to be paid for by third-party payers. So I think we need to have a a broader view of what the real cost is of doing this and who's paying for all of those costs. NIH is certainly supporting some of it as a research uh, into implementation, but that's only a small fraction of what all of this is really going to cost. I see Terry and Howard. I think Bruce was first. Okay, sorry, Bruce, I didn't see yours. I think the um, implementation guide that Kristen described really was an impressive um, sort of approach. What I'm wondering is the scalability of it, how much time and effort that represented. Is there a learning curve in terms of um, when you think about how many of these lie in front of us, um, how are we going to tackle that large task? It's a, a great question. And I think one of the reasons why we approached it systematically was to build kind of a a plug-and-play process for it, but I still think it's not feasible as far from a scalability perspective. 
Um, I think that the kind of the farther along we've gotten into it, we really see that it's not necessarily the process that we're kind of laying out isn't really necessarily specific to genomic medicine even. It's really just implementation. Um, and so I'm not really sure, you know, how, how that applies um, to even other disciplines. And so I think that there's, um, there's a process of building those guides, and then I think there's the bigger overarching themes of what do we learn from the process of building um, this website that builds these guides. And so I think that I don't think that specific strategy is really, um, you know, it's going to meet everybody's need and be able to be scaled to um, every potential implementation that might exist there. I think, though, that we can take the things that we've learned from it, which is that there are threads. We do need to distill this down to kind of what's the clinical question that that person's trying to answer. We need to make this accessible from a, um, you know, a, a, an interactive guided best practice stand, standpoint. We want to make this, so I think learning those things, I think, helps us to really then inform you know, strategies that are, maybe we are able to accommodate much, much broader and diverse implementations um, and, and then making, kind of extending that, I think. And that's really, to me, that's, at least for me, what, as we're sitting here talking, kind of reinforces that as I hear what Laurie's talking about, what everybody's bringing to the table is that I think we're, we're moving within genomic medicine to say, we're thinking about how do we, how do we equip people to be able to do this? And so I think it's a really important piece of the, of the puzzle. Okay, Terry. So maybe just to speak directly to that and to pick up on something that Stephen um, had, had mentioned earlier this morning, I, you know, there, there probably are some things that are unique or at least relatively specific to genomic medicine. And, and so if, if we can try to identify what those common threads are, um, whether it's family history or pharmacogenetics or, or somatic variant testing, um, you know, that would be, I think, a, a really useful thing to do, but it's not easy. Exactly, and you're right, there are definitely some things in there, and I think a lot of it has to do almost with the scientific complexity of, you know, of, in some cases, of helping people to approach and overcome that, and so, but there are a lot of things that are unique, and I think addressing what those are, pulling them out, I think, is, a, is an important part of that step. Yeah, and then, then my original question was actually a historical note, so I'll let it, I'll let it ride until the, the conversation dies, but Bob might have wanted to speak directly to what we're talking about, or maybe not. No. Okay, I think it's Howard. Then Dr. Yeah, so there are centers, uh, I think North Shore and Intermountain are two good examples of community-based but academically-minded uh, health systems that have invested in infrastructure within them. But the majority of, of health systems rely on consultants. And it has been hilarious to see all of the health system consultants that suddenly became precision medicine <laughs> consultants. Um, nothing's changed, no, in, no additional insights, um, but they're now that uh, person. I'm wondering whether um, ClinGen in particular, of the ClinBar, ClinGen Duo, and the Spark Toolbox have engaged with that community, whether it's webinars all the way through to them using the guidelines, just to try to raise all boats from what is uh, not very high level. So just to give, it's funny because those were some of the things that we thought about in creating the guides. And so we have tried to create it on a clinician-friendly level and disseminate that through um, uh, kind of clinician-level journals. And so, for example, when we're um, publishing about this, we really try to hit those frontline clinician-facing journals. I don't think that in and of itself is, uh, you know, is, is going to do it. Um, I think there's really two pieces. One is getting the word out to those groups. Um, and the other thing is making the tool really accessible to um, be used by those groups. And so something we specifically did to reach that community-based population, um, because that's, a, that's a really important to me, it's, that's essential that we really, it is, the uptake there is so much faster, um, I think, than within uh, many of our settings. Um, but one of the example that I can give is when we first built the implementation guide, we said, if you want to know about CPIC, um, I'm sorry, about clopidogrel CYP2C19, here's a link to PharmGKV. And we, we kind of got feedback from that, and we went back in and said, we revised all of those to say, to actually point to the specific area within PharmGKB. So here's the FDA label for CYP2C19. Here's the, here's the pathway. So we kind of even took a step back further and said, what questions does that person need to answer? To Like, what is it that they actually need to know about CYP2C19? Because they don't even know that. And then, it, you know, and really tried, so we tried to create the tool in such a way so that somebody didn't even, they didn't need to know how to use ClinGen or ClinVar or PharmGKB. We, we said, here's what you need to ask, and we're going to tell you exactly where the answer is um, to try to help overcome some of those things, but I think it's it's tough to uh, to disseminate to those groups, and we've done a lot of our implementations at, at UF within that setting 
and my experience in that group has just been just kind of doing it and then they get they get comfortable and then it, it picks up from there and so I think it's just a matter of getting helping people feel comfortable with it so in any setting and I think for us um, I wouldn't say that we've targeted any communities specifically our education thus far has been more broad um, within Klimvar, they do offer a monthly call in which they invite any members of the community to learn more about various Klimvar related topic, topics. And then within ClinGen, you know, we've primarily focused our um, education efforts thus far within the genetics community in general, but we're now looking to branch out more into non-genetics providers, um, so the other providers who might be ordering genetics, genetic testing that then might be faced with now what? Now what do I do? I have this result in my hand. How do I use resources such as ClinGen or ClinVar to help me figure out what I should tell my patient? Just a comment on that. I mean, I think having a cons consolidated resource is immensely important if we're really going to try to bring this information to um, non-genetic specialists. Um, when I go around to my primary care physicians for the education, the question is, well, where do I go for help? Well, you know, if you know I'm not available, et cetera. You know, where, where are resources? So genetic home reference. Uh, Barclin, Gen, CPIC, you know, these are all tools that if you can provide a couple of central points that um, p um, clinicians are, are, are reassured that there is an active movement to try to address these issues that are being brought up. Okay, over here is it uh, Bob Wilden? Uh, so just to, to follow up on that, there was a resource that we developed uh, in a future life uh, in, in, um, a couple of years ago, about a year ago, um, that's on the NHGRI website. That's just a, a table for primary care clinicians of a lot of different resources. So, um, the question I had was, or the comment I had was, that it, it occurs to me that so ClinVar um, uh, variants are uh, represent a, 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 a snapshot in time of the information that was provided to the laboratory, scribbled on on a page with in little tiny check boxes, um, uh, and that the laboratory's best effort at that point. There's no information. The information that follows that time, time point, which is what happened to the patient when you gave them toxic drugs, did they get better or did they get worse? What happened or did they you know, pass away and you had an autopsy to confirm the diagnosis? None of that information gets fed back into the system. So if, and, I'm, and I know that that's not an easy thing to do, but to maybe brainstorm about how to enrich that information. And so, because right now it's kind of like taking an exam and never knowing whether you got an answer right. So um, that would be helpful. That is an excellent point and something that we, we really wish we could do better at. We have a few kind of Band-Aid solutions to that at this time. So um, I didn't mention this explicitly, but I think I did kind of gloss over it. Everyone is encouraged to submit to ClinVar. It's not just a lab thing. Um, we want clinicians to submit clim to ClinVar, and we also have a mechanism for patients to submit to ClinVar. Um, and while they don't, yet have specific structured fields to capture that kind of information. There are kind of free text areas where we can get at that kind of information. So we do have at least a few clinician submitters right now who do things like say, you know, yes, the lab that did this testing, they have also submitted this variant and this is what they said, but here is the additional information that I would like to add, maybe some specific information about the patient or the group of patients that have this variant. Um, so that is certainly possible. One thing that ClinGen does that I did not get to talk about at all is we also have a patient registry called Genome Connect, um, whereby we encourage patients to actively sign up um, to submit their genetic and health information to us. We transform it into the structured format that ClinVar needs, and that allows us to help them put their information out there um, for people to use as well. And they're able to give us much more detailed phenotype information. And we also keep in touch with them longitudinally. They're asked to update their information annually, let us know of any significant changes. So we do try to collect that information in that manner. The problem is that there's not an optimal way to show that in ClinVar right now, especially because ClinVar is publicly available, so there are issues with consent and things like that. But we do have it. We do submit that information to ClinVar, so if you ever see a Genome Connect submission, you know that you can always contact us and we can personally provide you with the additional information. Okay, is it Dick or, yeah. So first of all, uh, I, I think this is a really important topic. And, and Mary, if nobody else says it, the effort that you and your colleagues put into CPIC in terms of developing those guidelines was absolutely essential. What you do and what the 
a Dutch working group does, I think is critical for pharmacogenomic information. But when the question that I think we're all going to face is if you just look at 2C19 was mentioned here, if you look at the ORF and the exome data that's out there, there are 250 non-synonymous variants. And most of those are rare. We know the genes are important because it has common variants. And I think one of the challenges that these groups, are, all of these groups, all of us are going to face is First of all, how do we get functional information? And there are high throughput methods which we and others are using. And if we look at these variants, just in, in our 10,000 patient study, half of them are inactivating for the gene. Uh, you're not gonna see those very often, but they're gonna be there. What are the thought processes where pharmacogenomics is actually shockingly a mature field or fairly mature field, comparatively speaking. And it's effective in terms of broad populations. What is the thinking about how we're going to do that? And I'm keenly aware, since Bob Diazio has his office right down the hall, how strongly he feels about uh, trying to not depend totally on clinical information, right. but use functional information. And how are all of these groups going to deal with that? And I, I think you deal with that on a daily basis. Right, and that's a great example, DPYD, of that was one of, if, if you look at the supplemental material that backs up the variant interpretation for that gene, it's got an incredible level of uh, tiers of functional confident, confidence in the functional assignment to each of those alleles. It specifically came down to based on predictions of the functional consequence of this or that variation in DPYD, would it be ethical to give the normal dose of 5-FU to a patient getting this drug? And so that's why it's so important that we've got a group of experts that are oncologists and pharmacologists as well as uh, molecular biologists who try to interpret every one of those variants. Now, what we are trying to do for each CPIC guideline is to, com is to annotate and add variants as they become known enough that they would be considered actionable. And we do update those tables of variants in each CPIC guideline. Um, and we update that material on the website so that that's, that's the critical step people have to go to is, to, is to go to the website to check on variants. We're making uh, an API so that companies and others can download that information every night and have constantly updated information. But it's a huge task, like Dr. Nussbaum was saying. I mean, it's, uh, it's really a huge responsibility that implementers are taking on when they're being more and more faced with whole exome or whole genome sequencing data as to what it's safe to call non-actionable and, and what has re reached some threshold where it is actionable. So you know, given the amount of work and the amount of expertise that's gonna be needed to make clinical actionability decisions on every single variant in all of these genes, it's so critical that we, as the scientific and medical community, figure out how to address this most efficiently and how to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, and do what, that's why my first question um, for Aaron was about what are we doing to consolidate existing groups like CPIC that have, have all this expertise going into variants, like all the cancer groups that are annotating somatically acquired variants. Um, so that in one place we can have that information available to people who are implementing genomic medicine. It's, it's a huge task. Rex. Yeah, yeah. And one of the topics of, um, no, I think it's, oh, okay. One of the topics of two genome medicine meetings ago was precisely this, is, and how do we not only look at the clinical community, but how do we leverage the basic science community who is using C. elegans or Drosophila or whatever model organism and providing really important functional vari variation information about these kind of functional assays. And there was a lot of discussion at Genome GM9, I guess, about, you know, is there some way to create a resource that would actually enable people to say, here's a list of vari I mean, it, it's, it's sort of there in ClinVar, right? But here's a list of variants. If you're an expert on gene X, my guess is that there's a lot of people out there would say, oh, well, I looked at that variant. I can say it's going to kill that enzyme completely. So it's really thinking about how to leverage that. And I think we haven't really completely figured that out yet. 
right. It's definitely no way. And and look, Bob Diazio, I just mentioned him because that's he's devoted his career to this. He's he's put together algorithms for looking at hundreds of these variants, which Mary I knows well and I know because he comes and sits in my office and talks about them. So we need to get the there's a Bob Diazio for every gene. I, I only pick on him because I know him, but there are several Bob Diazios for every gene. I think we need to preemptively begin moving to take advantage of that. I'm just agreeing with you, Rex. And I would add um, that ClinVar does accept submissions like that where you're just saying, you know, I I'm a lab that did functional work on this gene and, and this is what I did and this is what I say about it. So that is something they will accept. It's definitely not something that a lot of people realize and take us up on, but that is a possibility. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why um, in the creation of our expert panels, we like to see um, varied expertise. So we don't want them to be just stacked with clinical laboratory professionals or just with clinicians. We want a mix of those plus basic researchers who can inform us on the important functional assays that are associated with a given gene or disease areas so that when that group is making these specific recommendations, they can incorporate that. As you know, that's one of the categories in the APMG AMP guidelines and when one of our three-star groups is putting their guidelines together, they must specify it. These are the functional assays that we feel are relevant for this gene. This, these are the values that we think mean pathogenic. These are the values we think are undetermined. You know, this kind of level of detail goes into each one of those guidelines. And I would just add, I guess, to build on Howard's point earlier, another layer of complexity to kind of, I guess, um, operationalizing, you know, a, a strategy in that area is, what the that clinicians need is and whether they even identify that as being um the whether they even know to ask the, the questions about which you know which of these variants are functional and i know from our experience i coordinate the education for all of our clinicians and i've gotten feedback from our attendings when before we walk into a group of um, clinicians or psychiatrists you know they'll I, i'll th talk through like how do we want to build this educational program and they'll say 15 minutes max genetics everything else patient cases like don't don't get up there and talk about genetics and so it's a there you know and so that's a challenge I think it's a level it's a layer of complexity of kind of doing you know and, and what we've really seen is in that particular instance the that was not only what the group wanted but that was what influenced uptake of ordering the test and so we went back after that implementation every two weeks and pulled patient cases that they had ordered what the outcome was and we just walked through their own cases with them to kind of disseminate within that own practice and that is actually i think what drove most of all the actual usage of the test clinically after the pilot project was done so it's really there that that clinicians you know focus is is um it's, so it's bringing these two together these really important concepts of helping to do it in the right way, I guess. So, so if I could be rude and, and just jump on, on the, yes, <laughs> I am being rude. Um, the, uh, the, the specific point though that, that Aaron was making and Rex in terms of bringing the basic and the clinical groups together. So NHGRI now does have two solicitations out that are specifically for linking variants to function to disease. And, and I would encourage people, I know the NIH system is difficult, but, um, but this would, would really be a way of, of moving this forward. So I'm sorry, Mark. Okay, if you're giving money away, you can. Uh, okay, but let back. me let me. Uh, I think I think Dr. Nussbaum, are you are you have your your verticality? Is it meaningful? Because it's been up for a while. I want I wanted to um, address Aaron particularly and uh, in general uh, a a problem that, uh, that that exists and that has to do with a lack of clarity as to what kind of data sharing is allowed with and without consent. And um, the fact that there are regulations for HIPAA that are not necessarily concordant with regulations from other um, things like OHRP. Uh, I've had, for example, patients who've had testing done at our lab who've called up and said, I don't trust anybody with any information. So as soon as you deliver this report, I want all traces of my test removed. We want it wiped out of your databases because you may get hacked. And um, my response to them is under HIPAA, we're required to hold these for two years. So wh what do you want us to do? And um, to some extent, I don't think that these extreme, um, very highly suspicious outlier people should drive the conversation. 
but I, I, I do think that, for example, there are clinical laboratories who, to use a term, hide behind patient con uh, privacy issues not to share their data. And if we all agree that sharing data is extremely important, and I should add that getting consent from everyone adds a level of cost and logistics that will make the data sharing impossible at the level that ClinVar currently provides it. And so I think we need some sort of clarity as to what data can be shared, what level of consent is needed, and in particular for genomic information, how many variants and what their allele frequencies need to be in order for it to become identifiable. Because I also hear over and over again from people, oh, you know, if you put genetic information in, even if it's totally de-identified, that paper uh, that tracked the individual down to, to an, a particular person in Utah, you can cross-reference all these databases, and so there's no such thing as purely de-identified data. I disagree with that. I think there is totally de-identified genetic information up to a point, but we need much more clarity on this. And I'm wondering what NIH, NHGRI, uh, DHHS, could do to help make it very clear what we can and cannot do without sp uh, explicit consent. So I'm glad you asked that question. So Laura and I actually have a paper about this very topic um, that just came out a few months ago, just really trying you know, to address a very important point that you raised, that some laboratories do want to, for lack of a better word, hide behind this um, issue of consent in order to not submit to ClinVar. Um, as you may know, ClinVar itself is not an arbiter of consent. They assume that if you are submitting the data, you have the proper permissions to submit the data. Um, but in the paper that I'm referring to, and you can find it on the ClinGen website, um, we do lay out um, what pieces of information are appropriate to submit to ClinVar without explicit consent. Um, one of the reasons we feel that this is appropriate is because, as you point out, these things are quote unquote de identified, you know, as far as that can be done, you know, given the things that we're able to do now. Um, we do specify, you know, ClinVar is a variant centric resource, so, you know, we say in, in this document, please do not submit someone's entire VCF file all linked together. We're interested in single variants. Um, we want to know your aggregate experience with that variant. So if you've seen it in 20 people, you're telling us about your aggregate experience with those 20 people. But even if you've only seen it in one person, it's still appropriate to submit because you're not giving us any specific information about the person necessarily um, that's outside of the scope of what you might need to interpret that variant. We do then go on to say, you know, if you wanted to submit some more specific information, you know, such as the information that we're able to submit through Genome Connect, you should get explicit consent, which we do through that process. And we do have some generic consent materials available on the ClinGen website should people want to do that. Mark. Let me, I'm just going to comment briefly on that, but then get back to the point I was going to make. Uh, I think the other thing that people forget about HIPAA is that the HIPAA standard is that a reasonable person could re-identify the individual, which means you lay something on your desk and people could look at it and read a name and address and that sort of thing. There are a lot of unreasonable people out there that can re-identify stuff, but that's not the HIPAA standard. I also think it would be worthwhile exploring. Uh, I really uh, strongly believe that this would fall under the HIPAA exemptions for uh, uh, healthcare management, which is uh, exempt if you're using it to improve the management of the patient. You can share any information that you want, and quality improvement is also uh, exempted. And so I think that would be, uh, those would be other things to potentially explore. The point I was going to make. Uh, just, I, just, just in response to that, but I'm sorry, Mark, I'm, I'm being rude too, um, is um, I think there's some ambiguity that, no that, that people ambiguity. use as to whether, yeah. no, no, as to whether ClinVar is a research tool or is a quality improvement tool. I think it's the latter that can be used for research, but that is a ambiguity that is being um, misused. Yeah, I, and I agree with the misuse, and, and you're absolutely correct, and in fact, uh, if you look at the quality uh, standards, ClinVar is referenced uh, in terms of quality improvement activities, so I think there's, there's little ambiguity except for those that choose to make it ambiguous. 
Uh, the point that I wanted to make is that this discussion is really enlightening because I think what it reflects is the fact that Ignite, Spark, and ClinGen are perfect examples of what implementation can achieve because these are implementation projects. It wasn't something where we sat around and said, we've got to get it perfect because before we throw it out there. Um, and Lincoln will relate to this because at Intermountain we have a motto, which is every time we launch an improvement project, we guarantee it's wrong or your money back. <laughs> um, and the whole point is, is that you, you can't get it right sitting a, with a bunch of smart people in a room. It's only until you deploy it uh, that you're going to figure out what all um, is needed and what all could be actually be accomplished. Uh, and that's why the mechanisms to get the feedback and to engage, and I would argue that one of the biggest successes, particularly of, of ClinVar and ClinGen, have been the number of people that are willing to commit resources to do it uh, because they recognize inherent, the inherent value of this. And, uh, you know, in terms of the response of, well, yeah, it costs us a lot of resources to deposit the data, but at some point you're going to look and say, well, now I don't have to do this variant from scratch because this is a four-star variant that's annotated. I can just... I, I can release it. I can I can go forward with it. So um, I view these as as really important um, uh, projects, and that every you know perhaps criticism, if you want to call it, about something that it can't do or isn't doing or whatever, are actually opportunities uh, that we can really take advantage of. Got one last question here. I think is that. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I hope Eric. I'm going to talk to you a little bit, but, but I think to everyone, one of the points that Bob made is, is the challenge that we have of longitudinally following somebody with a variant. And I think if you ask me what the, the key next thing we need to do in genomics, it's figure out, and all of us is going to be tackling this a little bit, but figure out how we make health information portable such that we can longitudinally follow people with variants and with genomes. And so I think when you talk about the technology that is, is central to genomics, that is going to empower medicine wider. I think fundamentally it's this ability to collect people's genomic data and follow them longitudinally. We know Genome England's doing it, and they're doing it moderately well. Um, but, but I think fundamentally one of the questions that we really have to ask over the next five years is how do we make information available in a way that we can follow individuals with variants and see if they really have a disease or don't. We can follow individuals with a rare pharmacogenomic variant and see when they're actually exposed to that drug, what their drug levels are, do they respond in an adverse way. And this requires us to have ways of sharing data. When we implement things right now, we implement pharmacogenomics at my hospital. We don't implement it at a national level. Um, and so I, I think the, the push that we have to think about is how we do this in a joined up way across a fragmented healthcare system in terms of data, and I think that needs technology advances that we don't have right now. And so if I was going to be investing in technology, it would be that data sharing. I, if I could just add to that, I, I think um, there is some hope about that in the future. So I think those are who are participants of the All of Us program uh, will in fact be driving the technology that will allow us to do that. Uh, time will tell, it's early days, but certainly the goal is that if you're an All of Us participant, you will be able to you know, be tracked longitudinally over, over time, and hopefully that will inform the rest of our healthcare system. But. Is it Lincoln over here? Or no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just to uh, kind of comment further about, um, you know, following the policies and different regulations for genomic sharing, yes, a very important issue, but there's also the practical issue that in the community we face with the patient perceptions. And so as these policies mature, there needs to be, in my opinion, a concerted effort. Well, how do we address the the public about these and what's being done because there will never be a 100% foolproof solution. But again, to Mark's comments about a reasonable solution, but there has to be community education, hopefully through efforts like um, all of us cohort, that can happen. But I think that's an important thing if we really want to move things forward. We're tackling it as our institution of sort of, you know, well, what does our community, how do they perceive what's happening and where we're moving in this direction. Mary, I'm a, you, can, you can go a little bit further, um, as I long as people are willing to, to delay their lunch by a few minutes, because, you know, it won't take us an hour. I'm not sure if we've got people with signs up that are holdovers or if we have additional. There you go. Um, all right, so I, I guess just to quickly summarize, <clears throat> um, most of our conversation seems like it has focused on that we need resources to 
help with interpretation of variants and that interpretation has to extend all the way to clinical actionability in a way that's um, transparent and free and updatable and reviewed um, and accessible. Uh, but we also heard about projects such as that Ignite Toolbox, which is, is sort of taking a step back and saying what are the processes in the healthcare system that have to be addressed uh, in implementing genomic medicine. Um, and I think it was interesting, we sort of have been focusing on one variant at a time, one gene at a time. I'm sure at some point somebody's going to try to make a, an application for that toolbox that says, here's your whole, hec whole exome, how do you act on that? Um, but I think all of us in this room can, can realize that uh, it's, it's very difficult to do even when we do this one variant and one gene at a time, so we have to be careful what we bite off here. Um, and I, I took a lot of other notes, I'm sure you did, uh, too. Rex, is there anything anybody else would like to summarize about the resources section that we've just had? All right, one thank point, you. One point I might make, Mary, um, is, is that we're very sorry that Moeen was a, unable to come. He injured his back and, and couldn't get on a plane. Um, and so um, uh, he has agreed that we can send out his slides, or at least he hasn't disagreed. And since, he's not, <laughs> since he's not here. That means um, he's agreed? Uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, so Teji, maybe you could just mail it um, to the same list that you mailed the, the booklet. Yes, um, to, I'll, I'll do that this afternoon. That'd be great. Um, and then lunch is, as I, I know uh, many people have been hungrily watching them lay out our lunch uh, out there. Um, we're planning to be back at, at 1.30. Please do be prompt uh, at 1.30 and we'll start back up and see you then. <laughs>